All right, Tammy, I think maybe we should just go ahead and get started. Wonderful. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tammy Sigworth. I am the International Account Executive for Amplify, and I am absolutely thrilled to introduce uh, Tom Gant uh, this afternoon for you. Tom has a wealth of experience from being a biomedical engineer, a science a center educator, and over 15 years of middle and high school experience. Uh, he's also a national board certified teacher. So with all of this wealth of experience, he is hands down my favorite Amplify Science presenter. So I will gladly turn it over to Tom. And we do want to mention that there is a chat box in the very bottom of the screen. If at any time you have any questions, my Amplify colleagues and I will do our best to answer those, and Tom will be able to address some questions at the end as well. So thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, Tammy, and greetings, everyone in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, what I would like for you to do is actually practice using that chat button. So navigate to the bottom of the Zoom and find the chat, and let us know what city you're joining from. Um, where are you located? So I'm going to find the chat and I'm going to put in my location. I am in Miami, Florida in the United States. Let's see where everyone else is joining us from. Raina already put, um, she's in K KSA. Tammy is joining from Chicago. <clears throat> Samar from Saudi Arabia. We have Faiza from KSA. Excellent. So people are finding the chat button and letting us know where they're from. Fantastic. So while you continue to do that, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started into my presentation. So thanks for uh, we have Fatima joining. Thank you for, for sharing. We will be using that chat button a little bit later as well. Um, I want to check in and ask you questions, and I want to make this as interactive as possible um, for a webinar. And so this session is, you know, teaching students with NGSS to think about, you know, how do we enhance our English language learning in an academic subject area like science? Um, I was lucky enough to present this uh, in person in a TESOL Arabia conference, and um, it was such a good session that we're, I'm glad we're offering it now um, in this remote environment. And so my agenda today is pretty clear. Um, I'm going to start with talking about what is problem-based learning and tie that into the next generation science standards, which then will bridge us into what does 3D instruction look like? Problem-based learning and 3D instruction actually lend itself to language acquisition. So we're going to frame it that way. And then I'm going to jump into the six strategies for teaching English language learners across content areas. So these are six established strategies, and I'm going to apply them into the science classroom and also then showcase the Amplify Science resource that will help meet that strategy. It'll meet it head on. And then let's look at the full Amplify Science approach to learning in general. And we have some time for question and answer at the end. Like Tammy said, please use the chat feature to ask any questions. Um, you can pop uh, them in there and we'll be checking those along the way. So with no ado, let's get started. So like I mentioned, I'm joining you way over here um, in Miami. Um, you can see we're pretty much at the same uh, latitude across the globe there. It's probably a very similar environment with the heat and, and things like that. Um, and students are the same. No matter where we, I've traveled throughout the world and worked with educators, I find that Educators have the same challenges and students also have the same challenges, but those are also opportunities. And so we're going to focus on that. So my background is from teaching in Miami, Florida, where a majority of my students did not speak English. Um, I would say over 92% on average each year would not speak English. And where were they coming from? So I have a the school I taught at had a huge influx of students from Haiti, where they speak Haitian Creole, which is a derivative of the French language. Um, after some natural disasters that had happened there, we had some uh, quite a few students uh, come over, and then also from Cuba and, and South America and Latin America. So Spanish and Haitian Creole were the predominant languages in my in my school. With that, I had to go through you know ESOL strategies, TESOL trainings, all those things to really how do I adapt my science classroom for someone who's learning English, but also they're still learning their native language at the same time. And so we're going to use those strategies and apply them into the science classroom. 
So I'm going to start by asking you to participate. This is problem based learning right here. I want you to identify the object that you're seeing on the screen. So in the chat, if you know what this object is, or just make a, a guess, go ahead and find your chat and let me know what you think it is. There are no wrong answers. This is just to get your brain thinking in our warm up. <clears throat> so what would this object be? I'm going to give you a hint as well. Does that help? So what is this object? And as we can all see, it obviously is a toilet seat cover, a sanitary cover. And why would I show that, you know, and why is it important to me? I had a teacher in grade three, he used these toilet seat covers as a very inexpensive laboratory activity. He used problem-based learning around that toilet seat cover. He came up with a science problem. Can we test which substances can actually pass through that material? And then he made it a steam problem with mathematics. How can we calculate the perimeter, the circumference, and other mathematical properties of that material? And I still remember that project today. And that's what problem-based learning means. It can really allow students to become personal and understand and really get invested in what they're learning. So the true definition is it's it, problem based learning is a dynamic classroom approach where students get to actively explore explore a real world problem or a challenge and they acquire knowledge that is transferable. So really deep conceptual knowledge. So problem based learning and project based learning tie hand in hand into how we can teach science and really address the needs of our, our English language learners. So look at, let's look at problem-based learning in the science classroom around the NGSS standards and talk about how phenomena drives this approach. So when we talk about the NGSS standards and three dimensions, and I'll review the three dimensions, we have the core ideas, the practices, and the cross-cutting concepts from NGSS. And so it all begins though with a phenomenon. So a phenomenon is anything that happens in nature, that happens in the world around us that causes us to question or want to come up with an explanation. <clears throat> Students are naturally curious. Children are always asking questions. Why is the sky blue? Why does it rain? Um, why are there deserts? Why are there tropical zones? All those things are questions that students can, can question about the world around them around a phenomenon. And so we're shifting our instructional approach from topic teaching. And these topics are wonderful. I taught many of these topics myself, sound waves, sea turtles, and energy conversions. They seem just fine, but if we wanna have a three-dimensional approach around a phenomenon, let's, let's wrap that together into more of a, a problem. So how does a dolphin communicate underwater? In Amplify Science Units, we have a mother dolphin and her calf. How do they get back together in the open ocean? They're using sound waves to find each other. How can a sea turtle survive in a habitat where there's sharks swimming all around? How can they adapt? What, are they, what, what kind of tools do they have to survive? And then energy conversions. A town is having frequent blackouts where the electrical grid is malfunctioning and electricity is not working. So how can we solve that problem? And so this anchoring phenomena, as we call it, becomes what drives the meaning for the students. So if we can engage students, then we're already one step in into them wanting to learn. And so we're going to provide a meaningful um, anchoring phenomenon. And so three-dimensional teaching and learning is going to take these, I, these three parts and weave them together. The benefit of the disciplinary core ideas, the way they're written by NGSS, is that there's fewer, but we go deeper in understanding. <clears throat> so what I mean by fewer is I, I taught in Florida, and I would have in grade six, for instance, 153 standards that I had to cover. And you notice I said cover. I was just trying to get through all of those. Was I able to teach deep into those concepts? I didn't have time to. But what's nice about NGSS, it provides us that time to go deeper into these ideas. So we have the, the four areas of the disciplinary core ideas, earth and space science, life science, physical science, and then our engineering and technology. Those are then broken down by the subdivisions, as you can see here, like Earth's place in the universe from molecules to organism, et cetera, engineering design. So these disciplinary core ideas 
are really taking those topics and identifying what's most important at each grade level. When we think about these specific core ideas, this is what are the bulk of what we understand about the standard. It's the content. And so think of the DCI as the content. How do we deliver the content is where we bring in the other two dimensions. A lot of teachers get stuck in this uh, one dimension only, and I'll show you what that looks like. So let's go into our science and engineering practices or SEPs. These are broader in scope. <clears throat> and these are the action items. These are things we want students to be able to do in the classroom. So what does that look like? So I've broken them down into three parts. Our first three, asking questions, developing and using models and planning and carrying out investigations. Those really are about those experiments and laboratory activities. We're gonna define a problem or create a question and then create models or do experiments. That's the hands-on portion. And, and also your mind is thinking. One thing I always like to point out about number one here, asking questions and defining problems. Defining problems is more for engineering and asking questions is for general science concepts. We think about asking questions, teachers all the time say, oh yeah, I ask questions. But we wanna shift that to where students are now able to ask questions and give ideas and get get their ideas out and then have to come up with solutions. Now you'll notice number four and five, those are mathematics. So the science engineering practices has us interpreting data. But what does that data mean and doing some computational thinking? Um, so after we do investigations or we build a model, can we interpret the results? And then finally, these last three, constructing explanations, engaging an argument from evidence, obtaining and evaluating and communicating information. These are language. How do we, how, what's the language of science? How do we share verbally or in written form our arguments or our explanations? Or how do we get information? How do we obtain that from text or from conversations? And so we're gonna focus on that area as well. And we talk about language development. So these, these science engineering practices really tend to wanna allow us to have that language development in the science classroom. Cross-cutting concepts. So if I'm teaching an earth life or physical science idea or phenomenon, I will have cross-cutting concepts that are universal. There's patterns in life science. There's patterns in physical science. We have scale, we have structure and function. And so these are the underlying ways in which students can make connections from how they learned in one content area to another, another disciplinary core idea. And so we wanna bridge those into our standards. So three-dimensional teaching and learning will engage students to use the science and engineering practice. I like to think that that is the action that the students are going to accomplish. How are they thinking? That's the cross-cutting concept. And then all of it relates back to a problem, to a core idea of earth life, physical or engineering. So let's look at an example. So this is not a three-dimensional statement, but it looks like a perfectly good lesson. Students learn about different kinds of plants and animals in a habitat. Sounds nice, but we're focusing only on the core idea. And this is where a lot of teachers and a lot of curriculum get stuck. We, we think we're covering the NGSS, but we're only doing really the DCI. So let's add in a science and engineering practice. Let's see what that looks like. And now we have two dimensions. Students participate in a model to learn about different uh, kinds of plants and animals. Oh, hang on, let me move this out of the way. There we go. Um, and so with that, we still have the two parts. We have the core ideas and the science engineering practice. So students are going to participate in a model, which is great, but we're still missing the cross-cutting concept. What can we pepper in? This is a great three-dimensional statement. Students apply ideas about systems as they participate in a model, but now we're adding another science engineering practice. They're going to gather evidence, and they're looking at a relationship between plants and animals in an ecosystem. And so as they're learning about that ecosystem, they're applying ideas about systems in general. And keep in mind, systems is a cross-cutting concept that's in physical science, earth science, life science, and in engineering. And so this is the three dimensions working together. So when you're looking at your lessons or you're thinking about how those meet the demands of NGSS, make sure that you're bringing in those science engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts. And so the Amplify approach to, to making sure that this phenomenon, three-dimensional learning, uh, happens in the classroom. Um, I'm going to jump into that and show you. 
And I love sharing quotes. Uh, this one's from Benjamin Franklin, an amazing inventor. Um, he wrote, tell me and I forget. Teach me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. So the goal of those science engineering practices is to involve the, the learner, involve the student, instead of just telling or teaching. And so I, let's, I, it's taking that mindset and shifting it in that direction. And Amplify Science does this by what we call a problem-based deep dive. So we're doing the problem-based learning, but we're now focused. Students will actually take on the role in a unit of a scientist or an engineer. They're looking at a real career and they're going to solve a phenomenal real world problem, such as I mentioned about the town having blackouts or how does a sea turtle survive? This becomes the engaging three dimensions working together in a storyline. Students love storylines, and this is also a connection to our English language learners. It allows them an access point into the, to the unit. So we're gonna take those disciplinary core ideas. <clears throat> These are the, the things we want students to know. And then we're going to take those eight science and engineering practices, well, those action items what we, student, what we want students to accomplish. And then we're gonna pepper in those cross-cutting concepts, allowing students to make connections and adjust their thinking. We're going to anchor all three parts together with an anchoring phenomenon in Amplify Science. My example here, you see this train. This is what we call a magnetic levitation train, a maglev train. Students are going to need to explain how this train works. They're going to do this as a role of a civil engineer. So this is a grade three unit. And the phenomenon is model an explanation of how a floating train works operating with opposing forces. So the core ideas are gravity, magnetism, balanced and unbalanced forces. But they're working around this project to bring all those parts together and come up with their explanation. Let's take a look at this introductory video that st students would watch as they start this unit. The city of Faraday has arranged for a new train to come to Faraday. The citizens of Faraday were excited about having another way to get from place to place until they heard something about the train. It's a floating train. The people aren't sure what it means for a train to be floating, but it sounds strange. The mayor of Faraday is worried that people won't ride the train. She needs our help. The mayor has asked us to figure out a scientific explanation for how the new floating train works so she can share that information with the citizens of Faraday. So that's a really cool train, very modern science as we know it's being developed around the world and being used. Um, the interesting thing there, students are going to come up with their ideas based upon just that video. Now, I also made an accommodation. I turned the captions on. So we, throughout our science program, we want to make sure our videos, and they are, are captioned so students can read along as well as listen to, to, the, to the narrator. And so when we think about Amplify Science and how we are addressing phenomena driven instruction, we have phenomena based unit structures. So we want to start students by engaging with a real world and compelling anchoring phenomenon. So these phenomena are very interesting. A floating train is very interesting. And how does that work? It already starts that natural curiosity. And then we're going to come back. I apologize. We're going to come back and talk about how do we collect evidence from different sources so students can develop a deeper meaning and complex explanation. And then finally, we want students to take what they learn and solve new problems and apply it to a new situation. And so when we think about that, we're going to hit all the standards, but we also want to address all the students. In student diversity in the classroom, we have English language learners, we have students that might have special needs. And so we want to make sure that this approach addresses all those standards, but also focusing on those student groups. And so this is a question I want to pose you. Um, and before you answer, you're going to answer in the chat. I'm going to read through these. How do you learn best? as a learner, as an adult, how do you learn best? Do you like listening to lectures and does that work for you? Reading of text, writing notes and organizing information such as graphic organizers or collaborative discussion or utilizing visual resources such as videos, uh, images, technology or completing hands-on kinesthetic tasks. So find the chat and I want you to tell me in the chat, pick one of these, which is the way you learn best. Doesn't mean you can't learn from all of those, 
because as adults, we've learned to navigate that. But pick the one that appeals to you the most in your learning. <clears throat> we have writing notes and organizing information. I'm putting in visual resources. I like to, I'm a visual learner. Tammy likes to work in groups, listening and share ideas. So like a collaborative discussion. So I want you to think about how we learn best. So we have hands on. So when I was presenting this session in Dubai, a room of, I don't know, hundred people or so, I had everyone stand up and I went down the list and I said, if this one appeals to how you learn best, I want you to sit down. So when it, I said, listening to lectures, everyone in the room remained standing. And that was really eye-opening to me. Majority of the people in the room as adult learners were like, you know what, listening to lectures isn't the best way to learn. Yet they were listening to my lecture, right? Um, which is quite interesting. But if we think about the way we learn best, we need to have that same approach for our student learners. Listening to lectures may not be the way uh, to teach. Reading of text, of course, these are important because we wanna give instructions and have students read. But if we can shift down to more collaborative discussions, utilizing visual resources and doing hands-on manipulation, we're going to allow more access points for learners. And when we think about how that learning relates to retention of knowledge, this uh, learning pyramid has been around for quite a while. Lecture has a very low retention rate. Reading and audiovisual starts to increase. But when we get to demonstration and discussion and practice, of doing, and that's so science and engineering practices, then we're increasing the retention and the understanding of the concepts. And then of course, teaching others. So sharing ideas and, and, and sharing your, and teaching your, your classmates can be in a very important way to also retain the knowledge we're, we're teaching. So I mentioned before, we can say we cover the standards or do we actually develop con conceptual understanding of those standards? And that's the goal as we think about our English language learners as well. So these are the strict six strategies for teaching English language learners across content areas. And I, on the left, I have the strategy. And on the right, I have the resources that teachers need. And so we think about comprehensible input, for instance, we wanna shift our lesson delivery and the, the tools needed for that lesson. And I'm gonna use comprehensible input as my first example. And then we're gonna go through these other approaches and other strategies. So when we think about comprehensible input, I want you to think about the resources and how to shift that in the lesson. Because the single most effective strategy that I have used to teach English language learners is comprehensible input. So comprehensible input is a very key part of English language acquisition. And this comes from Cindy Garcia from Education Week. So we're gonna start by watching some video clips of Dr. Mary Ellen Bott. Um, she is a leader in this field and she's gonna share a little bit more about comprehensible input. Comprehensible input is a term that was coined by Stephen Krashen some years ago, and basically it has to do with just exactly what the, the name implies. The input or our speech to our students, our teaching, whatever we're doing needs to be comprehensible. Now, I think originally we were looking at primarily slowing down speech, enunciating carefully, making yourself as clear as you can with how you present orally your material. We have now broadened the definition of comprehensible input to include a variety of other things, such as I can be more comprehensible if I am showing visuals and photographs and illustrations. These can be things that students are looking up on the internet in order to support their understandings. They can be anything that the teacher brings in to illustrate a point. So slowing down our speech is a great technique, but also she mentioned visuals. Uh, visual vocabulary, uh, visual cue cards. And so let's look at that. Comprehensive. Oh, sorry about that. Input is comprehensive. And so I'm going to focus on our kindergarten unit. So this is one of our engineering units, um, our physical science unit as well, where students are going to be pinball machine engineers. And the goal is, as they engineer and design their own pinball, is to learn about pushes and pulls. Now, in kindergarten, we have language acquisition in English um, very early on, and so we want to make sure we support those learners. And so we're, I'm going to show you how a lesson uses visuals in that process. So this is the actual slide deck from the lesson. So with Amplify Science, every lesson has a slide deck in Google form as well as PowerPoint. And so here I'm using that exact lesson. 
So this is a picture. I cannot see anything moving and I'll share how I imagine the movement. So this is teaching students how to visualize to better understand what is happening. So let's look a little closer at that image. <clears throat> so if I think about this, I, I think there's movement happening here. I feel like this truck is pulling this car to the left. I don't see any brake lights on. And so I'm assuming there's some movement based upon what I'm visualizing. And so we're going to have students ex have a teacher explain this, and then we're going to go a little further. I'm going to show some more pictures. For each one, I want you to visualize what's happening. I want you to think about what is moving and what might be making an object move as well. And also you can act it out. You can think about maybe you can replicate with your body what you see in the image. So for every, all of my attendees that are participating today, I want you to find the chat button. I'm gonna show you an image and I want you to share with me, do you think there's movement and what is moving or what's making objects move in the image? So here's our first image. And so we have this oxen. And I wanna know, do you think there is movement from what you can visualize? And what is your evidence for that? What do you see that shows that there is movement? So I'm gonna find the chat. <clears throat> and think about what students, what would our little learners say when they see this image? Julie wrote, dust is coming up from the wheel. Oh, that's good, yeah. In the back, you see some dust. Students might identify other things happening. Do we think the ox is walking? Yeah, I may look at its legs, exactly. So if I just says, look at the legs, this one's being picked up. That's not a normal standing position, that's a walking position. And so students are going to look at those clues and start sharing that information. Now, one thing I want you to look at in this slide deck, down here in the bottom right, we have this little birdie. This means an on-the-fly formative assessment is embedded in the lesson. So I'm gonna escape from the PowerPoint and share the notes section. So in the notes section, I see my teacher actions. I would pair my students up and allow them to do a typical pair share routine. And I would monitor how students are making sense of what they visualized happening in the picture. And here's some questions I can ask my students. What do you visualize moving? Just like I was asking you. Why do you think it's moving? What do you think made it move? Can you show that movement with your body? And then I have this on the fly formative assessment, what to look for. The focal comprehension strategy in this unit is visualizing by using information read, read or seen in books. As students are talking about the movements they visualize based upon the projected images, listen and make note of individual students or partners who are attending to the particular elements of the image and are using talk and gestures. And so if we're, we wanna identify those students who are, are working it out and solving that problem. And here's a now what? What if my students aren't quite getting it? I can repeat one or two accurate examples of students that were successful and share that with the classroom. So you will see in our slide decks ways to address that language acquisition through our formative assessments, through discussions and partner share routines. And I'll get into our other discourse routines as well. So in our, in our uh, slide decks, I like to say they're a clickable lesson plan. We have everything embedded as well as our formative assessments. So let me go ahead and continue playing from my current slide. There we go. And so then we're gonna introduce this role. Engineers work together to learn about things they study. And so as we look at these pictures, they're gonna share with their partner and what movements did you visualize? Let me just show you a few more examples. So students will talk about this and they'll have this discussion and they, they think, oh, the elephant looks like it's using its trunk to push that log. And, and I would believe that. Looks like the elephant's being herded maybe by this gentleman in the back. The elephant's taking a step forward. And I can see the trunk is bent. Looks like it's ready to push that forward. And so students were going to use this image as well. And so the goal is to reinforce vocabulary. Now vocabulary development with all learners and especially English language learners doesn't need to be overwhelming. And so in an Amplify Science Unit, there may be 14 to 15 new academic words such as visualize but we're not going to put all of those words up on the wall. So we do provide, like I have behind me here, unit questions, chapter questions, printed vocabulary cards, but we're gonna gradually introduce the vocabulary over time 
and students experience it in a lesson. So we're talking about visualization. So let's use visualize as a keyword and to make that picture in our mind. So this card here would also be in our material kits. So in Amplify Science, we provide the material kits with all the print materials as well as the hands-on manipulatives to make this kind of instruction easy. So we're slowly, gradually introducing the vocabulary over the course of the experiences. Now let's go back to Mary Ellen Boyd and let's listen to her talk about another strategy. Certainly the use of textbooks and how they're laid out, how they're organized has to do with comprehensibility. If a book is too cluttered and has too much information and too many charts and graphs and pictures on a page, it's not comprehensible. So the teacher will then need to do something to help the youngsters be able to navigate through that text. If a text has no support materials, then no words are highlighted or bolded or explanations are not clear. Once again, the teacher needs to take note of that and help the students understand what is there. So text access features are very important for language development. So let's look at how Amplified Cert Science will provide that resource. So active reading strategies can be applied to text both in print and digital formats. And so with Amplify Science, we're going to provide in the K-5 primary space actual physical books. So students will have access to these books, but also those books are digitized. And I'll show you some of the digital and video features that allow students to learn with better access points. In middle school, in grades six, seven, and eight, our students graduate a little bit more into reading science articles that are also in print, but also digital. And so these resources allow students to gather evidence, but we're gonna support them in learning the language along the way. So here you see one of the elementary texts. It has an audio function. Animals also need to eat so they can grow and survive. Different kinds of animals eat different things. What do these animals eat? So this is the same book that students would have physically, but it's a digital flip book. You'll notice the keywords are identified, like Dr. Mary Ellen said, and really allowing students to access what they need in this. A lot of big images as well. It's not going to be complicated on the page. Too many graphs, too many uh, sidebars can be very confusing for English language learners. And so you can see here a digital version of the text. Now we also have a video of a real teacher. She's there in the corner and she's reading the text to the students. So let me play her. Animals also need to eat so they can grow and survive. Different kinds of animals eat different things. What do these animals eat? Scientists ask questions like this all the time. In this book, you will find out what some animals eat for lunch. Whose lunch is this? A zebra can be a lion's lunch. Lions are predators. And so you can see the benefit of having the video of the teacher. She's pausing. She's changing her voice and her tone to allow students to com comprehend. So this is just another way we provide access. So we have print book, you have the digital student book, and then you have a video of a teacher reading as well. Animals. When we get to middle school, here's an example of one of the articles students would read. And the article is chunked on purpose. You're going to see a graphic, a paragraph, and then another break. Yeah. Cellular respiration. You may have heard the word respiration to refer to breathing air, taking oxygen into your lungs and releasing carbon dioxide through your mouth and nose. And also the audio, read aloud for the student. Students are going to be able to access definitions and keywords. They're going to be taking their highlights and looking for ways to support their learning they could add they could add questions they could add notes for their teacher and they're going to be giving active reading assignments to find evidence in the text um, all their work stays saved in their own account and i also like to think about how do we provide access point for students that might have dyslexia or dysgraphia students can expand the spacing expand the letter size to where it becomes a readable text so the interactive ability of the interactive text allows those access points but beyond that we also can allow translations and so here I have Google Translate on my browser, and I'm allowed to then translate into the AI languages uh, that Google supports. So here we have Arabic. Um, we can also translate to other languages that might be uh, with your students. Um, so here's Urdu. And so the goal is to just once again allow those access points. It even translates the notes that students might put in in their annotations. 
And so the interactive text is another access point for our learners and also how they can showcase their learning as well. We also want to make sure we're supporting learners just with that vocabulary development. So at every grade level, starting in kindergarten all the way through grade eight in our program, we have a multilingual glossary. It has about 15 of the more common languages. And so it starts with Arabic, as you see there. And so we can also print this out. We can provide this resource for families at home as well as for students. Um, and so they can see the words that they're learning in both languages. And so we're supporting through that multilingual approach. So access and text features is another way to support comprehensible input. So let's head back to this classroom with Dr. Mary Ellen Vaught and see what else is next. Graphic organizers are used widely in classrooms. They can certainly help English learners to structure the complex information that they are learning. One thing that I like to encourage teachers to do is to fill one of the graphic organizers in partially for students to use. The key topics may be included in the graphic organizer so that the students have an opportunity to complete the rest of the graphic organizer on their own. In the secondary grades, teachers can use study guides and for the English learners, some of the topics could be filled in ahead of time. So graphic organizers and using those and maybe helping pre-fill parts of those for our English language learners. So Amplify Science is gonna provide student investigation notebooks. These exist in print and I'll also show you the digital features. But the student investigation notebooks do provide those graphic organizers for our learners. And you'll see we have areas here, for instance, where there's a word bank that we're providing them to label the diagrams from their hands-on investigation with these different objects and magnets and things. And so it becomes that point of also students showing their work, but also providing that access point where they can show their work. So they can draw, they can label, they don't need to be able to write out full English statements and sentences to complete the work in the notebook. And so providing that graphic organizer is very important. If I need to make that accommodation, like the teacher said, I could maybe fill out this first section here, the falling ball, as an example, as a diagram for the whole class, and then allow them to do the other three, or even I can do two of them. So making those little adaptations will help our English language learners. When we talk about the digital version of those notebooks, we have some really great features. So if I'm teaching this lesson digitally to my students, this notebook page will appear on their screen and they can have all these amazing tools to use. You'll notice here we can take and embed pictures. So maybe they developed a model and they want to take a snapshot of it and it'll be right there. We can also add audio recordings. So maybe a student can express themselves verbally, just maybe not be able to write out a full sentence yet. And so you have the ability to record voice memos that the teacher then can play back and listen to. We can insert text boxes like you see here, also cloudy, today it's sunny. And then of course we have these amazing crayons that can be uh, drawn in different sizes and erasers. And so it becomes an interactive text feature. The beautiful part of this, it also is our system is designed to auto save the work. A student doesn't have to hit save on these interactive notebooks. And then a teacher has everything coming in real time in their dashboard. So we can progress monitor also students who might be struggling with what to write or what to say. So very interactive. So you have the print version of the graphic organizers as well as the digital experience. Let's head back to the classroom here and go a little bit further. We can also do a lot of sharing with students. I like to have kids do activities in which one will be perhaps reading a short passage to the other. The other then paraphrases back or tries to repeat the information back as best as he or she can. This is not only uh, helping to make the content more clear, but it also gives them an opportunity to use English. And if they're not using English, they will not learn English. So developing partner reading strategies. So how do we develop those strategies? With, with Amplify Science, we're going to embed in the lessons and in the slide decks themselves, discourse routines. Everything from over here, you can see a TPS, which is a think, pair, share strategy. Um, sometimes we'll even take it to the next level, think, pair, share, and write. Um, but you, you'll see these varieties of discourse routines embedded in the lessons. So having students have those conversations and using English language, making sure they're using the vocabulary, that they're, they're noticing on the wall that they've already been exposed to that the teacher has uh, highlighted for them. And so using those vocabulary words in their conversations. And so in our slide decks, we provide the questioning strategies and everything embedded for the teacher. So these discourse routines become just part of the lessons and the teacher just has to facilitate that and then make sure they progress monitor the students. 
So for example, I mentioned think, pair, share. We're gonna think about the question individually. Students will then partner up, talk about it. They have one chance for discourse and using language and then sharing with the whole class, which is an additional chance. So just once again, more chances to use the language, like uh, Dr. Mary Ellen said, using English language is the way we're going to get better at understanding it. Other ways that we can make those content <laughs> concepts clear is by paraphrasing okay. frequently when I'm giving information. I may certainly keep my lectures to a minimum for English learners, but sometimes you do need to provide information orally to students. So if I can present this information in more than one way, it gives the students an opportunity to hear it in more than one way. So she mentioned paraphrasing or pr providing information in more than one way. How can we do that? So Amplify Science has what we call a multimodal approach to learning. And we also embed that approach around a gradual release of responsibility model for developing literacy and science. We want to start with teacher led instruction in reading until we emerge into student independence. And it may take some time depending on the levels of the students. It may happen in a year, it may take two years, but we're going to start by reading aloud. And then we're going to do shared reading experiences and partner reading. So what does this look like? The first mode is a teacher read aloud. The teacher models expressive reading. We're going to demonstrate how to read and, and the key points of that, gathering information from a text, thinking aloud about the content of the book, whether we're looking at images, whether we're looking at uh, data tables, and then also focusing on that vocabulary development. So a, a teacher is going to read, and that, that may be the case for the first couple books or maybe all the books at a particular grade level. The goal then is to shift, though, is to have students take some ownership with partner reading. So the teacher is going to demonstrate how the texts are organized. We're still going to point out the vocabulary and support these reading strategies. But we also want students to observe the teacher, follow along, maybe join in in discussions about certain key points where the teacher is stopping and then practicing on the comprehension of keywords as well. After we have student and teacher, we want student to student. So partner reading, and this is great when we think about those science and engineering practices of obtain, obtaining and collaborating and getting information from each other. This is perfect. Scientists work together, so why not read together? And so we provide the partner reading guidelines and students are gonna work together to gather information. This will usually come after students have been exposed to content from a previous reading or a hands-on investigation. And I'll show you in a lesson how we follow up a hands-on investigation with a reading activity and it seamlessly works together. Students are gonna use questions and routines and also practice that vocabulary. So everything they learn from their teacher, they're now applying with their partner. And we also wanna support writing. So we provide language frames and writing scaffolds such as here, blank cannot live there because the blank they need is not there. So maybe animals can't live there because the food they need isn't there. So something along that line, but we're providing the framing to allow students then to insert the, the words as a whole group. We also have the shared writing experience where students work together. In addition, we wanna support our, our learners in different ways. So we have language frames, mini books and emerge, for emergent writing. And so students can color, organize, draw. And so we, you'll see with our graphic organizers and these mini books, the access points for our different language development. So the six strategies, you know, we wanna talk about making lessons auditory, visual and kinesthetic, and that's a multimodal approach. Also, using cooperative learning strategies means less lecture, like Dr. Mary Ellen said, and more student work. Modify our instruction by having students learn and practice vocabulary in context. So roll the vocabulary in as is experienced, not front loading it. And then meaningful resources for effective planning to allow that content to come alive. So let's look at this multimodal approach that Amplify takes. When I think about the multimodal approach, it also relates to that idea of multiple intelligences. Anything that is worth teaching can be presented in many different ways. These multiple ways can make use of our multiple intelligences. So if we think about teaching the content in different ways, instead of just lecture and memorization, we're going to allow that concept to develop. So that's from Howard Gardner. And so our research behind this comes from our authorship team, the Lawrence Hall of Science at the University of California, Berkeley. We call them LHS for short. LHS has been creating quality scientific educational programs for over 60 years. And 
when the new standards were created, the NGSS standards, Amplify was designed, Amplify Science, we partnered, Amplify partnered with the Lawrence Hall of Science to bring Amplify Science to life to meet those expectations head on. And so in this process, the Lawrence Hall of Science did research around this multimodal ex exposure to students and experiences. We call it do, talk, read, write, and visualize. So each lesson may have anywhere from three to five activities. In that lesson, you might have one or two or maybe even three different modalities of learning to address the different learners in the classroom. This is very engaging and appealing for English language development. We have data to support this. So on the lighter color bar, <clears throat> that's the control group where students were using their same way of teaching and learning with their, uh, with their resources, and then using the do, talk, read, write, visualize approach. And so with that, you can see reading comprehension improved, and this was using science, science vocabulary and content increased as well. This is general aggregate data. Student writing also improved. And how is it possible that a science program can increase writing? But we really focus on the use of evidence. You can see that really, really improved. The use of evidence from text as well as also from hands-on investigations. How do we apply that and share that out? And then our English language learners excel. And you can see here we have huge gains in reading comprehension, science vocabulary, and science content knowledge. This does require a shift, but if we continue to do what we're doing and teaching the way we've always taught, we're going to always stay around these lower numbers. But if we can think a little bit differently and use this multimodal approach, our English language learners are going to catch up and excel with their counterparts. And so phenomena-based unit structures allow this development. We have the engagement early on, and then we're collecting evidence. That's our do, talk, read, write, visualize approach to increase our understanding. So let's break that down. What does it look like? Do means hands-on investigations. So in Amplify Science, we provide the material kits with all the hands-on components that you need. Then we want that scientific discourse, that talking. So these are the eight different discourse routines I mentioned that are embedded in the lessons where students are going to have those English language conversations using the vocabulary terms. They're going to read, whether they're reading the books or the articles, depending on their grade level, or using the digital books, and then writing their findings and showcasing their learning in the graphic organizers. And so that would be in the print or the digital version. And then the visualization happens. And so I mentioned visualization shows you a very simple lesson with just images, but we have multimedia videos, interactive tools and simulations to allow that development. So let's go into some of these digital tools that allow visualization beyond just a, an image. And so this is what's called a modeling tool. And so these seeds of this tree Students are going to try to figure out where they can grow. Well, they don't grow on the sidewalk and they don't grow in the shade. Uh, but if I put one in the soil or I put one in the grass, it gives that ch chance to grow. And so you will see these are what we call modeling tools where students, once again, can demonstrate their understanding. And very easily, without having to really understand a lot of language, students are uh, able to understand how this system works. We think about sorting. Really, the only words that students need to know are these key words at the top, wind, water, and carried on fur. And then we have visualizations of the seeds. And, and students can even look at how that seed is structured on how it might actually be dispersed in the environment. For instance, this maple seed looks like it would be a little helicopter and fly in the wind. And the puncture vine looks like it maybe gets stuck to some fur. And so we have these sorting tools, which also allow these access points. And data collection is super important. Those were two of those science engineering practices were mathematics. And so students here don't have to create amazing Excel spreadsheets. They just have to put their numbers in from an investigation they completed in their group. And so you can see here this squirrel population, this little animal um, declined over time. Do I need to necessarily know all this language? Not really, but I can definitely see a trend. We have it from high and it went down to low over time. And so this just allows another way for students to express their learning, but also access that information. Simulations allow for some really cool investigations. This one comes from our traits and inheritance unit where students are going to take these spiders and breed them to try to create a new silk for a tendon that's torn in the human body and in the arm or the leg. And so the visualization process happens here where students can see those chromosomes and they can see them coming back together, contributing from each of the parents. We also get to see what the offspring look like, and we can explore the different traits like flexibility. Greg was low 
Zora was high with that silk flexibility and my offspring were medium and low. We can go even further in our visualization by looking at a cell. Clicking on a spider, we can see the proteins and the shape of that protein that's responsible. If I change the trait to stickiness, the protein shape changes. If I change it to venom, it changes. So visualizing that each protein is responsible for a trait is a true depth of understanding that our simulations allow students to get to. Now, keep in mind, I'm, I showcased that very quickly. Students will be using this over the course of a unit as they explore the phenomenon. Now let's go into a lesson and give an example. So we watched the video of the floating train earlier, and now we're going to start figuring out some ideas about how do objects move. So this is the actual slide deck from lesson 1.2 in grade three. We're going to start our activity by discussion. So keep in mind, collaboration and discussion was one of those access points for English language development. Students will watch that same video. And we'll talk about the role they're going to play as scientists, looking at motion, things moving, floating, and falling. And then we're introduced that think pair share routine. And then Let's focus on a question. What could make the train rise up off the track? They could say things like wind. Uh, maybe it looks like something at a theme park that they've been to. Um, you know, maybe they're not sure and it's okay. We're going to let them share out their ideas and we're gonna say, you know what? We're gonna find evidence to see which one of those ideas might be the best. And as we go through, we're going to focus on our, our print materials here, which is on the wall. Why does the train rise? And well, how do things move to begin with? We have to figure that situation out. So we're gonna complete an activity making blocks move. Now, the beautiful thing about Amplify Science slide decks is that we do have embedded videos where this, this teacher is going to explain how to do the, the lab experiment, or you can do it yourself. But I always like to have our little guest teacher here explain. We are going to try and find ways to make these blocks move. In order to investigate safely, only move the blocks sideways along the floor or desk. One way to make the block move is to hook a rubber band on one end. Only stretch the band a little so the block doesn't move too quickly. Now you will try and make the block move yourselves. These are the materials you will be using in your investigations. Try different ways of moving the blocks, even if you aren't sure they will work. All right, and we're introducing that vocabulary word. We're gonna observe and make those observations and then share them out. So we're gonna use these materials. These come from our, our kit and we even have the Ziploc bag to organize it for our groups. And then here's an example. Like, well, like we mentioned, um, Dr. Mary Ellen said, if we can fill out the graphic organizer and give students some ideas, um, it'll help them in, in the accessing of, of their drawing and their wording. And so here we provide that example and students will complete their work in their notebook if they were using the digital experience, they would have all those cool tools to make that happen. And then we wanna share it out. This is where we have that discussion. So we have a classroom observation table where students will share which objects they used, what happened, and they'll classify it as a push, pull, or not sure. And then they're starting to look for a trend. There is a pattern here. Most students are going to realize that if they have touching objects, they can push and pull them. And we call that touching forces. And so we're looking for that pattern, which is a cross-cutting concept. Now we're gonna use this observation table for the next lesson, which is literacy driven. And I know I'm running a little short on time, so I'm gonna go a little bit quicker. So students are gonna read this and looking for evidence of forces, but we're also going to pay particular attention to the images. So we can get information from the text, but also the visuals. And I see there's a ball dropping off the desk. We're gonna mark the page with a sticky note because we're gonna eventually transfer that knowledge to our notebook and to our anchor chart. So students look at the visuals here, they're gonna say, oh, the skateboarder, there's forces there. There's forces on the, bo the boy going down the slide. And so you will also see they're reading about it, but also using the images and that provides language development. We're gonna share that back out to the anchor chart. So we'll have firsthand evidence from the hands-on experiment and then we're adding what we find from the text. So we're seeing value from both sources. And we're going to do that with a variety of lessons where we go through the do, talk, read, write, visualize process. And we're shifting away from lecturing down to those discussions, demonstration, and actually practice and doing, and students sharing, teaching each other for that higher level of understanding. And so the six strategies for teaching we're going to hit throughout our program. And then the last thing I want to talk to you is how do we connect this back to students' personal knowledge? We provide cultural and linguistically responsive teaching supports in our program. So how do we tap into what students already know? 
Students will create in our experiences and what we think we know anchor chart with their teacher. And this becomes a very important feature in our program. And so the goal is to inquire, model, quantify, read, talk, write, critique, argue, and learn English like a scientist. So I'm not going to ask you to flush your current methodology and your current curriculum, but definitely consider ways of shifting. Um, and Amplify Science allows that shift by supporting through these learning support principles. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing so we can answer any questions. We have a couple minutes left. Any questions from yeah. our Hi, Tom. We actually have a, a raised hand. Yes. From uh, Rasha. Rasha, I'm going to allow you to talk <clears throat> as a setting here. So if you want to ask your question. Um, we can't hear you, but maybe you can put it in the chat if, uh, if anything. It looks like she might be muted, right? Yeah. Uh, she looks like she disappeared, actually, somehow from the... Well, I want to thank everyone for joining. If we, We'll stay on for any more questions that might uh, pop up, but also keep in mind, you can contact your Amplify uh, account executives and sales representatives, and we'd be more than happy to have further conversations with you, um, send samples, et cetera, to your schools. So we'll stay on just for a little bit. Um, you will also re re will receive this recording. Um, it'll be sent to your email that you registered with, and you can share that with any and everyone in your network of educators. Thank you for joining. I know it's afternoon. You probably taught school all day. And you're probably ready to get back on to uh, the rest of your day. So thank you for, for joining us on this, this webinar today.